uses data to change audience behavior. A very flat-footed response when this nightmare story broke. 2018 was going to be the year that Facebook would do things differently. Under intense scrutiny from governments and their regulators over fake news, hate speech, and political manipulation on his platform, Mark Zuckerberg vowed to fix things. Then, last weekend, the New York Times, along with The Guardian and Observer and Channel 4 in the UK, broke a story that shattered Zuckerberg's PR campaign. Together, they revealed that Cambridge Analytica, a data analysis firm employed by Donald Trump's election campaign, harvested the personal information of more than 50 million American Facebook users without their permission, and then used that information to create targeted political advertising in order to influence voter behavior. The issues here go far beyond one data mining company and one election. Voters in Great Britain and Kenya may have been affected as well. And the story puts the spotlight squarely on Facebook's business model and its mass surveillance of people like you and me to make their money. Our starting point this week is the man who blew the whistle and blew the lid off of one of social media's dirtiest secrets. One of the more puzzling and contradictory aspects of this story is how, even in this digital age, where data has been crowned king, information is often not enough. Sometimes a story needs a face, a source willing to go on the record to register with audiences. Somebody like the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley. Because the details, what the company did, how it mined Facebook for political purposes, had been reported before more than two years ago. Well, we've known the broad outlines of the Cambridge Analytica story for a couple years. Since 2015, we've had a little bit more information in 2017 when The Intercept published a long report on this as well. But Christopher Wiley coming forward gives us a lot more detail on precisely how this worked. Collaboration is a really powerful thing. It helps make the story concrete for people in a way that before it might have felt a bit abstract. What Christopher Wiley showed was a bit of an insight into the inner workings of the company and how they wanted to build these models. They called them psychographic models. And so he, he gave us the most detailed look yet at how Cambridge Analytica works and what it was trying to do. This story goes back four years to when Chris Wiley was Cambridge Analytica's director of research. The company contracted a British data scientist, Alexander Kogan, who had designed a Facebook survey app for a study into online behavior. Participants who downloaded Kogan's app and took the survey were each paid a dollar or two for that and for access to their personal data. 270,000 people took part, but it didn't end there. Like all other apps operating on Facebook at the time, Kogan's app was able to harvest the information of not just participants who had consented, but of all their Facebook friends as well, who had no idea that their personal information was being collected. It was no glitch. It was a design feature of Facebook's platform. That's how 270,000 participants in the US exposed the private information of another 50 million Americans enabling Cambridge Analytica to target those people with specifically tailored political ads on behalf of its client, presidential candidate Donald Trump. When you authorize those apps to access your profile, you're potentially giving away a huge amount of information. And so whilst Facebook is ostensibly stunned and outraged by this kind of data collection, it's exactly what the platform does exactly what the platform's there for and it's what the policy specifically allowed back in 2014. Now we should be shocked about this but we shouldn't be surprised. Companies and app developers and, and scientists could develop apps, plug them into the Facebook system and get access to all this rich data. You know scholars who have been watching Facebook have been raising alarms about this since 2010 but nobody was listening. Nobody listened except a few regulators in Europe and in Washington, D.C., and Facebook encouraged it. This was Facebook policy. So now that Facebook people are acting all surprised, all hurt, like they're the victims, I have to laugh. 
It took Facebook more than four days, four entire news cycles, before its CEO managed to produce a response. By that time, the market had spoken, shaving more than $50 billion off the company's value. Mark Zuckerberg's post was apologetic. Facebook failed its users, he said. Mistakes were made. The company had to do better. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Among the things Zuckerberg failed to mention in the media blitz that followed, Facebook had threatened to sue the Times and The Guardian if they went ahead with the story. And Zuckerberg implied that what those papers had reported was news to the company. It wasn't. As, as far as, as we understood um, around the time of that episode, uh, there was no data uh, out, out there. As one commentator put it, Mark Zuckerberg wasn't responding to the facts because the facts were not new to him. He was responding to the furor, which was. So Facebook discovered that this um, data had been passed to hands that it wasn't meant to be in back in 2015. And it moved to ask Cambridge Analytica, who had got the data, to delete it. Did they check that you'd deleted the data? No, they were just satisfied with the form. The big question really is why didn't it do any more and how could it be sure that it had deleted it? And the big question that regulators are going to be asking Facebook is why didn't you tell us in 2015? And why didn't you ban Cambridge Analytica at that point? Because they actually only banned Cambridge Analytica from Facebook just as this story was coming out last week. What a weak response. So they, they, don't, they can't use Facebook, like they can't, they can't play words with friends anymore, they can't post about their birthday parties. Uh, that seems like a pretty useless penalty, but it's all that they have. But clearly Facebook had not cared to prevent this from happening, had not audited the companies that had taken the data, had not followed through. Facebook had the legal and moral responsibility to make sure that this data stayed safe. Instead, they have tried to make it just a matter of this sleazy company, Cambridge Analytica, uh, uh, taking advantage of Facebook. Well, of course they did. This story forces us to consider not only Cambridge Analytica, but Facebook itself. The 50 million profiles that Cambridge Analytica has, allegedly, is just 2% of Facebook's 2.2 billion profiles. Facebook has incomparable processing power compared to any other company. So what are we going to do when Facebook decides to uh, change its algorithms and manipulate and influence people towards its own political or commercial ends? Or what about when Facebook manipulates people's news feeds under government pressure? How are democracies potentially being reshaped? Because Cambridge Analytica has not limited its work to the U.S. presidential election of 2016. That same year, it worked for the Leave side in Britain's Brexit referendum, and was also hired by President Uhuru Kenyatta in last year's Kenyan election. Two electoral processes that were close, and in the case of Kenya, disputed. And those are just the campaigns that we know of. This is just the tip of the iceberg. In many countries in the developing world, Facebook is essentially synonymous with the internet. You think about a country like Myanmar, a country like Cambodia, Facebook is how people interact with the internet. So there are enormous implications for the types of decisions that Facebook is making about who is allowed to provide political messaging on these platforms and who has the resources to do so. Information is power and data is power. The average person goes onto Facebook to connect with friends and family, but that's not what Facebook is there for. Facebook is a intelligence database, essentially. It's great to be here with you today. That exists to gather data about people to better advertise to them. This is a new way of doing modern politics and it just can't be sustainable. We just can't have a democracy that relies on exploiting deeply personal information about people's private lives uh, in order to try to recruit voters. Facebook was perfectly designed to crush democracy, to mess with democracy. It was not intended to. It sort of accidentally turned out to be this perfect tool for this perfect storm. And you can see democracy being threatened around the world right now. It's not a coincidence that most of these forces find Facebook to be a very effective tool. Tremendous great jobs. 
Facebook didn't cause our problems, but Facebook is amplifying them. It's a big problem. It was a bad idea in the first place, and there's almost nothing we can do about it now.